Well, Robert, thank you very much for that extremely kind uh, introduction. And thank you for the invitation that's come this evening from both the Constitution Unit and the Judicial Institute to come and talk about the operation of the ECHR and the Human Rights Act from a Conservative perspective. I have to say that throughout my time in politics, but particularly since I became Attorney General in 2010, I've really come to value the work uh, that you have done here and your events and your publications. Now, in speaking on human rights as a Conservative, I'm conscious that it's going to be argued that my own perspective and that of others in my party may differ somewhat on this matter. Perspectives on policy issues are, however, rarely uniform in any political party. When I go to address Conservative audiences away from Westminster, views on the merits or demerits of human rights law are more complex and often more nuanced than the reading of a tabloid newspaper might suggest. An attack on the abuse of human rights law by litigants who may be regarded as undeserving is likely to attract very loud applause. But as a recent YouGov poll suggests, lay people are in fact quite capable of identifying that the issue has no one answer and are of divergent views in respect of the different questions that the human rights legal framework raises. On being questioned, 78% of Conservatives wanted to see the Human Rights Act repealed and replaced. 75% consider that British courts should not have to take account of rulings of the Strasbourg Court. But the vast majority supported each one of the ten key rights in the Convention. Even the allegedly unpopular right to a private and family life in Article 8 was endorsed by 78% of those Conservatives interviewed. This strengthens me in my view that despite the Conservative leadership's recent announcement of fundamental change to both the HRA and our relationship with the ECHR, there's much that remains undebated and misunderstood about both. I'll try therefore tonight to lay out reasons, while not free from imperfections, the ECHR and its direct application in our law through the HRA is of enormous benefit to our country and our collective well-being. I emphasise in doing so that this is intended, not intended to be an academic's presentation, although I trust I can inform my opinion with reasons based on evidence, as a lawyer should. The politician in me is determined that this argument can and must be made with some passion, because I believe it goes to the heart of our identity as a nation and of our national interest. In considering the benefits of the Convention, a good starting place is the reasons why we signed up to it in the first place. Much ink has been spilt on whether the Convention was or was not a near-perfect British construction, willed by Churchill and David Maxwell Fife, crafted by British barristers, or, as I sometimes hear, some unfortunate importation of foreign abstract concepts of rights, alien to our national common law tradition of liberties and dangerously undermining of them. There's no doubt that the drafting of the Convention and our adherence to it were controversial. The British participants looked to establish a list of detailed, clearly defined rights, whereas the French and some of the other nations preferred a general list of principles that would be left to a supranational court to clarify by its decisions. There was unease as to how this would work in practice. Contemporary Foreign Office advice expressed fears that the Convention would be subverted. Uh, their uh, pay note to the Minister said, to allow governments to become the object of such potentially vague charges by individuals is to invite communist crooks and cranks of every type to bring actions. And yet we signed, and it isn't difficult to see why. For all the criticisms, the ten key rights originally protected under the Convention were, with the exception of Article 8, in reality a classic exposition of the liberties which successive generations of British politicians and the British public generally have insisted are our shared inheritance. How well they were in practice maintained through the centuries, however, is very questionable. There have been plenty of examples of their violation. But they're part of an entirely distinctive national narrative, embodying the common law, its confirmation through Magna Carta, its numerous reissues in the Middle Ages, the outcome of the conflict of authority between King and Parliament in the 17th century in the Petition of Right, the abolition of Star Chamber and the prohibition of torture, habeas corpus, the Bill of Rights of 1689, Lord Mansfield's ruling on slavery in Somerset's case, and the commentaries of William Blackstone. 
This national narrative has been so powerful that it has acted as an almost mythic restraint on successive British governments trying to curb freedoms when tempted to do so by threats to public order or national security, as we saw over 90 and 40 day, two day pre-charge detention under the last government. Doubtless it is that in the years after the Second World War, most Britons considered that this largely political tradition offered a superior level of protection for freedom than any continental model. Paul Johnson, I think, correctly identified the underlying attitude in his History of the English-Speaking People when he wrote, and I quote, The extraordinary attachment of the English to their system of law if indeed it can be called a system, the positive affection it inspires, the awe-inspiring confidence often unwarranted which they repose in its ability to do justice, the tenacity, indeed ferocity, with which they refuse to modify it with foreign importations is one of the most important national characteristics. And he went on, in a sense, the law is the only true English religion, the only body of doctrine in which the mass of ordinary Englishmen have consistently and passionately believed. It's impossible to turn to any period of English history where written records have survived without finding a huge and dogged conviction in the adequacy of the law, if only, and this is the vital qualification, it is administered according to tradition and custom. Complaints about the law are purely conservative in nature. It's not being observed. It's fallen into disuse. It's being obscured and perverted by innovation. Grievances are strident and incessant, but they're invariably directed at agents, not against the law itself, provided that modern accretions are periodically removed. So I accept that in signing up we were really doing something novel. We were intent at the risk of innovation through the creation of rights that we ourselves enjoyed as liberties not so much on protecting ourselves, but on setting a standard of behaviour for states towards their citizens, which would prevent the re-emergence of tyranny in Western Europe. But as we know today, the ECHR has indeed created its own dynamic. By converting liberties to rights, it's facilitated their ownership and assertion by individuals, rather than their mere invocation as ab abstract principles against administrative or policy decisions. The anger of the tabloid press at undeserving claims is the inevitable corollary that claims by the deserving can now be made. Deservingness cannot be determined a priori. Some argue that this has taken the interpretation of the Convention by the Strasbourg Court and our own courts to places unintended by its original signatories. But it seems to me that it was quite clear from the outset that this was a possibility, and yet we signed up. And then we continue to sign up to protocols to the Convention, and most importantly, to recognise the right of individual petition in 1966, with little or no argument to the contrary. Indeed, as Hansard reveals, the principal advocate in Parliament on the floor of the House was Terence Higgins, a notable right of centre Conservative, almost certainly because he feared the curbs on freedom he suspected a socialist government might introduce. This shouldn't surprise us either. It's been the intention and policy of successive UK governments over the last two centuries to seek the make the world a less dangerous, more predictable and better place by encouraging the creation of international agreements governing the behaviour of states. When I was Attorney General, I inquired of the Foreign Office as to how many treaty commitments we, we had adhered to. They were unwilling to go back before 1834. But they indicated that since then, they had some 13,200 records of treaties and agreements that the United Kingdom had signed and ratified. Many thousands are still applicable, and range in importance from the UN Charter to local treaties over fishing rights or maritime access. Over 700 contain references to the possibility of binding dispute settlement in the event of disagreements over interpretation as, of course, does the ECHR. And with the passing years, these treaties, be they a UN Charter, International Convention on the Prohibition of Torture, the creation of the International Criminal Court, have dealt not just with interstate relations, but with the standards of behaviour between a state and those over whom it exercises power. So important has been this treaty making 
that the Ministerial Code specifically states that it's the duty of UK ministers and civil servants to respect our international obligations. And it's this duty which is, was now seen by Lord Bingham's eighth principle as being a key underpinning of the rule of law. So in 1966, the misgivings, which is quite clear the Wilson government had, that in allowing individual petition, it would create problems for the state, those were outweighed by the national interest in promoting this wider agenda. It does seem to me to be noteworthy that in the current debate on the impact of the Convention on our country, very little is said about its impact on the other signatory states. The very thing which underlay our decision to sign up. Yet a moment's examination shows that it has been profound and beneficial. Some of the earlier cases, such as Marquix and Belgium on the rights of illegitimate children, or indeed Ireland and the United Kingdom on how interrogation techniques constituted inhuman or degrading treatment, are well-known landmarks in the development of human rights norms for member states, which we now take for granted. <coughs> But since the adherence of so many states that had previously been governed by communist tyranny, the Convention and the Strasbourg Court have been instrumental in facilitating the creation of the rule of law in environments where it had never previously existed. Let's just look at a few examples, familiar I'm conscious to some of you, but I think probably largely unknown to the British public. Last year, in Mamadov and Azerbaijan, an opposition leader in that country published a blog post on a riot that contradicted the government's version of events. He was subsequently accused of inciting the riot in question, imprisoned for seven years for endangering the lives of public officials. The Strasbourg court held there had been breaches of Article 5.1. There was no basis for the reasonable suspicion required to justify his arrest and detention in the first place or of Article 5.4, as his claims as to the unreasonableness of his arrest had been dismissed without proper consideration. The court merely copying out the prosecutor's submissions on the matter, and a breach of Article 6.2, and the state had put out a press release indicating his guilt before he was tried. Avalkina and Russia. St. Petersburg local authority was found to have violated Article 8 in ordering all hospitals to disclose medical information on those who'd refused blood transfusions with the intent of rooting out Jehovah's Witnesses. Held there'd been no pressing need for this disclosure of confidential medical information, no prior opportunity to object, no effort to balance the right to ensuring public health with the privacy of the applicants. Campianu, Romania. Violation of Article 2, where a Romanian young man abandoned as a child, HIV positive and mentally disabled, transferred aged 18 from a centre for disabled children to a neuropsychiatric hospital where he was found by a local NGO in an unheated room with a bed with no bedding, dressed in a pyjama top and with no assistance to eat or use the lavatory, and died the same day. And I could go on. Series of cases ranging from beatings up and torture in Russian police stations in the context of a complaint system that didn't work, Ukrainian local authorities rendering an applicant's house uninhabitable and his land unusable by the construction and development of a cemetery next door that breached environmental health laws, and that's all before we start looking at big cases like Abu Zubaida and al Nashiri, where Poland was found to have participated in holding terrorist suspects in secret prisons and torturing them after they'd been unlawful fully rendered there by the United States. Looking at the Strasbourg Court website, the most recent judgments, cases concerning breaches of Article 2 and 3 in Romania in not investigating the torture and death of demonstrators at the hands of the police in 1990, and against the Greek government for not including same-sex couples in new civil union legislation. It's been argued, of course, that the Strasbourg Court is failing because so many of its judgments remain unimplemented. It's a matter on which our own Prime Minister commented when he addressed the Council of Europe during our presidency in 2012, emphasising the need for states to comply. But this can't be blamed on the court. Furthermore, while the number of unimplemented decisions is currently over 11,000, with the chief culprits in descending order Italy, Turkey and Russia, 9,000 are repetitive cases, and the evidence suggests that with political pressure from the Council of Ministers, most will eventually be implemented and that the authority of the public judgments leads to beneficial changes in behaviour by the authorities in the states concerned. For 
all its problems, the Convention has proved, I think, and is proving, to be an effective tool, perhaps the single and most cost-effective one currently available for promoting human rights on our planet. And that brings me to the next question of how successful or not the Convention has proved to be for our own country. Now, from reading the paper recently published by my party concerning the state of domestic human rights, the message is that all is not well. The intention behind the Convention is lauded, but while it's described as, I quote, an entirely sensible statement of the principles which should underpin any democratic no nation, and acknowledges that the United Kingdom had a key role in its drafting. It then goes on to assert that, I quote, both the recent practice of the court and the domestic legislation passed by Labour, I think that's to say the HRA, has damaged the credibility of human rights at home. It accuses the Strasbourg Court of mission creep, outlines a programme of fundamental change, advocating the repeal of the HRA, its replacement by a new Bill of Rights, which would, I quote, clarify rights under Articles 3 and 8, to prevent their abuse in respect of deportation cases and confine the right to invoke a breach of human rights to, I quote, cases that involve criminal law and the liberty of an individual, the right to property and other serious matters. Providing, again, I quote, a threshold set by Parliament below which Convention rights will not be engaged wants to limit the reach of human rights cases to the United Kingdom, removing the activities of British armed forces overseas from its scope. It also advocates breaking the link between British courts and the Strasbourg Court so that no account should be taken in future of Strasbourg Court rulings, and asserts that the United Kingdom will negotiate a new status for itself under the Convention, where Strasbourg Court judgments are merely advisory and no longer an international legal obligation to implement or, if this can't be achieved, leave the Convention entirely. Now, criticisms of the workings of the Strasbourg Court are not confined to politicians. From Lord Hoffman in his speech to the Judicial Studies Board in 2009, Lady Justice Arden's Thomas More lecture of the same year, more recently views expressed in speeches by Lord Judge and Lord Sumption, a critique has been made that the Strasbourg Court has failed on occasion to respect national differences in interpretation of the Convention which should be allowed under the principle of the margin of appreciation and also failed to appreciate sufficiently the practical limits of its authority if it gives judgments which contradict settled democratic will in areas where the margin of appreciation might be reasonably considered to apply. Now I think these criticisms are valid. The Strasbourg Court's shown signs of being the victim of its own transformation from an international tribunal dealing with a very limited number of cases into a final court of appeal for some 700 million people. In service to what has been an understandable desire to protect human rights in countries with challenging records, it has sometimes micromanaged the Convention too much, sought to impose a uniformity of practice that is not desirable in the interpretation of an international treaty that specifically gives to national parliaments and courts the primary obligation to uphold the Convention's terms. The problem caused by the court's decision on prisoner voting in the case of Hearst is, for me, a good illustration. In itself, the issue is largely symbolic, so the question of whether or not convicted and sentenced prisoners should have the vote is of very little practical consequence. But symbols can matter in the context of parliamentary democracy, and the judgment, in my opinion, was an unnecessary interference with a policy that enjoys overwhelming parliamentary support and cannot, I believe, be categorised as a substantial interference with a human right. I'm sorry I wasn't able to get it fully reversed when I intervened in the case of Scopola and Italy on the same point. But I have to say that as a lawyer, this is, regrettably perhaps, not the first time I've disagreed with a court decision in a case in which I've appeared. <laughs> Courts are human constructs. Their decisions are as open to criticism as any other, and lawyers and parties on the losing side will usually be discontented. Yet, in a number of key cases involving this country, the court has made adverse findings which an overwhelming majority would now conclude were correct. I have never been lobbied by a single colleague on the grounds that Essen Marper and the UK, in which the Strasbourg Court held that the UK policy in England and Wales of the indefinite retention of DNA and fingerprint profiles of acquitted individuals, the only jurisdiction in Europe to do this, I might add, 
was unjustified. But never has it been suggested to me that that was wrongly decided. I've never, for that matter, been told the decision of the Strasbourg Court in Dudgeon, which held the criminalisation of homosexual acts in private in Northern Ireland breached the Convention, was wrong, despite it being a very controversial decision at the time. But furthermore, there's evidence that some of the problems disclosed by Hearst, which is a judgment which does go back to 2005, are being addressed. In 2012, I helped Ken Clark as Lord Chancellor negotiate the Brighton Declaration, which sought to address the backlog of cases, the quality of judicial appointments, most importantly got the principles of subsidiarity and the margin of appreciation into the preamble of the Convention, so as we hoped to steer the court towards avoiding the type of decision we saw in Hearst. We might have achieved more and actually changed the text of the Convention itself if our fellow signatory governments with which we negotiated and, which, and who shared our goals had not been deterred by their own domestic NGOs from full cooperation with our agenda because of a fear that we wish to diminish the court's effectiveness. That was a mistaken fear then, but I have to accept that the most recent Conservative Party paper is going to make further progress on this harder. It's a bit early to say if the Brighton Declaration will bring about the changes we intended. But there are signs that we were going, that we're going in the right direction. The backlog of cases is being reduced. 99.9% .9 of the cases brought against the United Kingdom in 2013 were struck out as inadmissible. There's been solid progress on implementing judgments. Furthermore, the important shift by our own national courts away from the principles in ULA defining the requirement of take account of as being the close mirroring of Strasbourg decisions, has initiated a dialogue that has led to a number of cases in which the Strasbourg court has shown deference to the reasoning of our own. We can see this in the way the court moved from a condemnation by a chamber of the court of our rules of hearsay in al Khawaja to the acceptance of the Supreme Court decision when the Grand Chamber revisited al Khawaja following the rejection of its previous judgment by the Supreme Court in Horncastle. Proactivity by our own judges pays jurisprudential dividends. Furthermore, in the vast majority of instances, carefully reasoned decisions by our own superior courts are usually accepted by the Strasbourg Court. Abu Hamza was no more successful in arguing that his trial in the UK for soliciting to murder was unfair due to adverse publicity than he was in challenging his later extradition to the United States. And while I accept that the decision of the Strasbourg Court in respect to the deportation of Abu Qatada in 2012, may have been irritating for ministerial colleagues in adding further cost and delay to the process. It not only eventually allowed his eventual departure to Jordan, but helped ensure reforms to the Jordanian criminal justice system that were not only much needed, but overwhelmingly welcomed by all right-thinking persons. Seeing that promoting human rights abroad has been a central plank of the foreign policy of successive British governments for decades, including in particular the present one, it had reason to join in that welcome. But the response was to view the glass as half empty, when to my mind it was rather more than half full. This pessimism was also illustrated by the response to the judgment of the Strasbourg Court in the Animal Defenders case on our domestic ban on political advertising and its potential infringement of Article 10 on freedom of expression. The court upheld our court, own court's view that it was permissible, fell within the margin of appreciation for a settled national practice commanding support from all political parties. But the reaction from some of my colleagues here was that it was outrageous because it was only a majority decision. There is, of course, a more fundamental objection raised sometimes to the Convention by those in my party. It focuses on its interpretation as being a living instrument, which it's been argued has developed to undermine the intention of its signatories. The implication, if taken to its logical conclusion, must be that the Convention should have remained fixed in the moral and ethical norms of 1950. Judicial interpretation to reflect modern times is not new, not confined to the Convention, and rooted in our own common law tradition. As Baroness Hale stated in her Gray's Inn reading in 2011, it's in a comparatively rare case as an Act of Parliament has to be construed and applied exactly as it would have been applied when it was first passed. Statutes are said to be always speaking, 
and must be made to apply to situations which should never have been contemplated when they were first passed. In 2001, a member of the family, first used in 1920, could be held to include a same-sex partner. In 1998, bodily harm in a statute of 1861 can be held to include psychiatric harm. And in 2011, violence can be extended beyond mere phys physical violence into other sorts of violent behaviour. In all these examples, she said, the court is seeking to further the purpose of the legislation in the social world as it is now, rather than as it was when the statute was passed. And that, of course, is exactly what the Strasbourg Court has done in cases like Rancev against Cyprus and Russia, in holding that trafficking fell within the definition of slavery in Article 4, or in S. and Marpa, in identifying the blanket retention of DNA as being a breach of the right to private life in Article 8, even if the existence of DNA was entirely unknown in 1950. Another complaint that I get from colleagues is that the Convention is encroaching on our ability to conduct military operations. This the paper seeks to address by restricting to our own national territory the operation of any replacement Bill of Rights. I recognise that the bare possibility of a claim being successful through the extension of the Convention to the deaths or injury of our own servicemen abroad in an active service setting, arising from the judgment of Smith and others and the MOD in the Supreme Court, has raised understandable concerns. I also agree that the overlap between international humanitarian law and the ECHR lacks clarity, so that uncertainty exists as to when the ECHR will apply to the investigation of improper acts against enemy military or civilians abroad. But the principles of the standards of behaviour required of our own armed forces in conducting operations cannot be diminished by restricting the ECHR territorially, even if it might deal with issues such as the legality of detention arising from cases like al -Jeddah. And I note in this respect that the most recent judgment in Hassan against the United Kingdom in September in Strasbourg has clarified the law helpfully on the compatibility of detention under the Geneva Conventions with Article 5 of the Convention. I strongly suspect, therefore, that restricting the scope of the Convention territorially will not deliver the benefits assumed in the paper. I also note the most recent suggestion that a new Bill of Rights could be used to give greater protection to the press. No detail has been given, and I really do wonder if any study has been made of the existing case law. From FT Limited against the UK in 2010 on, there is ample authority to show that Article 10 rights are available to protect journalists, particularly with reference to their sources. I'd be interested to see what else is on offer. In any case, I have to say, I think it could be offered without any change to the Human Rights Act at all. Indeed, looking carefully at the paper my party's produced on changing our relationship to the ECHR, I am struck by the paucity of concrete examples of Strasbourg mission creep that are identified to justify a case for change. Complaint is made that the Strasbourg Court has ruled in Dixon and the United Kingdom, that the United Kingdom government should allow more prisoners to go through artificial insemination with their partners in order to uphold their rights under Article 8. It slightly sidesteps the fact that this was already allowed on grounds of maintaining family relationships before that ruling, and that the ruling does not confer an absolute right to this service at all, with the Justice Secretary considering each case on its merits. I also note that as of 2013, it had led, since the judgment in 2007, to 13 applications of which only one had been allowed. Prior to the judgment, there had been three allowed out of 28. Secondly, it's alleged that the Strasbourg Court has made the imposition of whole life tariffs impossible because in its judgment in Winter, it's insisted that there had to be some possibility of review of such sentences in order to ensure compliance with Article 3. <coughs> Yet, as was made clear by the Court of Appeal in the case of McLaughlin, such a review mechanism has always existed and has to be operated compatibly with convention rights by the Justice Secretary or risk judicial review. At present, therefore, this example of mission creep is hypothetical and of absolutely no practical effect. Finally, the Convention is blamed for allowing foreign nationals who have committed serious crimes in the United Kingdom to use the qualified rights, by which I take it to refer to the rights under Article 8, to remain here. It's this, along with proposals to reform the application of Article 3 and its definition in deportation cases where there's a risk of torture, which forms the heart of the proposals of change in the paper. 
I'm in the entire agreement that Article 8 has been invoked too often to try to justify foreign criminals escaping deportation at the end of their sentences. But this has little to do with the ECHR, a lot more to do with the failure of the UK Borders Act 2007 to address this issue as intended. That was why Parliament has recently enacted the Immigration Act 2014. It's intended to be compatible with our adherence to the Convention. It makes clear within that framework Parliament's perception of what the public interest requires in such cases. Where a sentence of at least four years has been imposed, the public interest requires deportation unless there are very compelling circumstances over and above the cultural and family relationship ties that are set out for, when it concer for, for foreign criminals who are sentenced to a lesser period of imprisonment. If it works, and in introducing it the government believed that it would, it's difficult to see how the proposal in the paper which promises to put the text of the Convention into new primary legislation would improve matters at all. It's difficult to avoid the conclusion on reading the paper that the real problem for its authors is not so much the interpretation of the Convention by the Strasbourg Court or indeed our own domestic courts, but the frustration that an international legal obligation prevents the United Kingdom government from being able to ignore judgments when it considers that they're adverse to its view of what is in the public interest. How else can one interpret the suggestion that what are recognised as, I quote, inalienable rights under Article 3 should be capable of a little alienation in respect of deportation by substituting a new unspecified test for that of a real risk but one apparently nevertheless in line with what is stated as, I quote, our commitment to prevent torture and in keeping with the approach taken by other developed nations. Well, at present, 47 of those developed nations accept the current interpretation of the convention by the Strasbourg Court. Even the United States, which does not, is fettered in its discretion to deport by the International Convention on the Prohibition of Torture. One of the reasons why they found it so hard to empty Guantanamo. So either the change proposed will in fact be of almost no effect, or if significant, it must undermine one of the key principles of the conviction, the convention. Similarly, with deportation, the paper indicates that a foreign national who, I quote, takes the life of another person, close quote, will be excluded from invoking Article 8 altogether so as to be able to remain in this country. But what taking a life means isn't specified. Does it cover just murder? Is it to include manslaughter? Death by dangerous or even death by careless driving? Will it apply to minors? Will there be a sentence threshold because some of these offences sometimes properly attract non-custodial sentences? By seeking to micromanage the application of convention rights in this way, provide no element of judicial discretion, the intended policy risks causing injustice. I also note that the Home Office's own statistics show that only two murderers and five convicted of manslaughter have been successful on this basis from 2009 to 2013. The same criticism has to be made of the intention that Parliament will determine a threshold below which convention rights will not be engaged. Such an exercise, I think, is likely to prove difficult and fruitless. It will still have to be subject to judicial interpretation, and I think it will add to and not reduce litigation. The courts of our country have well-tested processes for preventing abusive claims, taking up time and cost. At the start of this talk, I deliberately chose to look at the international dimension and benefits of the Convention before I turn to its impact here. We don't as a country operate in a vacuum in this matter. As I mentioned earlier, the paper suggests that we should, after enacting our Bill of Rights and Responsibilities, seek the agreement of other member states of the Council of Europe that the judgments of the Strasbourg Court should thereafter be merely advisory for us. Failing agreement on which, we should leave the Convention. It must certainly be the case that our relationship with the Convention will be in question as it's impossible to see that the proposed Bill of Rights can be compatible with it, entirely different from the position which my party adopted in its manifesto when promoting a Bill of Rights in 2010. Now, such a course may be strictly lawful, 
but its practical consequences are likely to be devastating, both for ourselves domestically as it will be for the future of the Convention. Domestically, our non-compliance with the Convention calls into question the devolution settlements for Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, which enshrine Convention rights as governing all their actions. Parliament at Westminster could, of course, legislate to change that position, but there is evidence that this would be against the will of the devolved administrations. In the case of Northern Ireland, it's also part of the Good Friday Agreement, an international treaty. At a time when the future of the United Kingdom is still in question, and I have to say the peace settlement in Northern Ireland remains fragile, it opens the prospect of a new area of political discord quite apart from the possibility of our courts having, or the Supreme Court, having to operate different rights systems in one country. For a unionist party, this does seem to me to be a very odd thing to do. Furthermore, adherence to the principles of the Convention is explicit in our membership of the European Union. At present, the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg is confined to applying the Convention as enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights only to matters within EU competence. But it has, as I know from my time as Attorney General, been notably expansive in this respect. And it's properly been a goal of government policy, successive British government policy, to try to limit this trend. That's why I argued the case of Chester and McGeer, myself, in the Supreme Court, when it was suggested that EU law could be invoked over prisoner voting rights. But I really can't think of anything more likely to accelerate this trend than claims being brought before the European Court of Justice by persons who consider that they're being denied access to convention rights and they can get no redress either domestically or through the Strasbourg Court because we're treating the judgment there as merely advisory. The likely consequence must be that as long as we remain in the EU, the European Court of Justice will expand its jurisprudence to give redress and of course its judgments will then have direct effect here against the government of the United Kingdom. But these constitutional consequences pale for me compared to the effect on the operation of the Convention itself. As an international treaty, its success is dependent on the peer group pressure among its adherents to promote respect for it and help ensure its judgments get implemented. That's why it's inconceivable that we can negotiate a special status for ourselves within it, and why our departure as one of its principal creators and supporters will be so damaging to it. It's already the case that countries such as Russia are using the United Kingdom's position to try to procrastinate on implementing judgments. Indeed, the effect of our conduct will go further as the United Kingdom's ambivalence is being cited by countries such as Venezuela in ignoring obligations under the American Convention on Human Rights arising prior to its denunciation and departure from it in 2012, and uh, Britain, and citing Britain's approach as a justification. And the same has been done by the President of Kenya over the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. I have to say that I think it bodes ill for all whose lives have been or could be beneficially affected by the existence of the Convention and the work of the Strasbourg Court and by human rights conventions generally. It flies in the face of all the good work done internationally by the United Kingdom government to promote human rights for so long, and I should explain being done on a day-to-day -day basis by the Foreign Office and DFID at this very moment. I have to say that as a Conservative this pains me. Whatever the challenges of the Convention has posed, and I accept that there are some proper grounds to criticise its operation. The failure of ambition represented in the paper, the narrowness of its moral and political vision, is frankly very disappointing. But I have no intention of ending this talk on a gloomy note. The debate on which my party is now embarked is one that I believe need not lead to our withdrawal from the Convention or such an adverse outcome for human rights or our national interest. Now this isn't some prediction of mine as to the outcome of the next election because I wish and trust <coughs> that a Conservative government will be returned. It is because I note with some pleasure that the paper is clearly based on the premise that the text of the Convention has now become so well implanted into national consciousness 
that it meets the Paul Johnson test. It's therefore to be retained, whatever the contradictions with the paper's other ambitions. It's also pleasant to note <coughs> that the paper clearly accepts that the increasing power of the modern state to intrude into people's lives requires a statute to protect the citizen. But as importantly, I believe that those of us in the party who see the maintenance and promotion of an international system of human rights as being in the national interest and entirely in keeping with a conservative tradition of freedom under the law will win that argument for the reasons I've tried to set out this evening. But we mustn't stay silent. Thank you very much. Thank you.